Hello, my name is Diane Southard and welcome to your DNA questions answered. Now, before we get too far into this, I just want to cover some very basic principles. There are actually three kinds of DNA tests you can take for your family history. The mitochondrial DNA traces that direct maternal line that goes down the bottom of your pedigree chart. The Y DNA traces a direct paternal line which goes across the top of your pedigree chart. All of our Q&A questions today are talking about autosomal DNA, which is the kind of DNA you get from both of your parents, which covers both sides of your family. So I just wanted to establish that up front before we jump into our questions. So here they are. Here's our DNA questions for today. Now, obviously, you probably have a lot more than this, but I'm hoping that these basic categories are going to give you a good foundation upon which to build in your DNA knowledge. So let's jump in, shall we? Number one, ethnicity. I still get this question all of the time, and I've been in this industry for 20 years. So if you have questions about ethnicity, you are not alone. Now, for me, I speak in analogies. So this is my favorite analogy for why we get the results that we do when we talk about ethnicity. And we're going to talk about this in terms of B and trying to figure out what she had for dinner. Because essentially, isn't that what we're doing in our ethnicity results? We're trying to figure out something about our past, like a location where our ancestors may have been. So in my situation, we're trying to decide, did B have a burger or did she have a taco? Now, at first you might think, okay, this is a pretty easy question because burgers and tacos are pretty different, right? So we should be able to tell for sure if she had a burger or a taco. But when you get right down to it, burgers and tacos are actually really similar. They both have ground beef, they both have tomatoes, they both have lettuce, etc. So in DNA terms, we call these pieces of a whole or the pieces of the DNA that we're looking at SNPs. And they're just single changes that occur in the DNA that kind of leave a map for us to follow, to see where our ancestors may have come from. So in our situation today, we are going to ask about one SNP. Now, your ethnicity estimate is based on hundreds of thousands of SNPs. So I'm just talking about one. But I think you'll see as we go through my example that this one can help you see all the complex things that go on when making your ethnicity results. All right, one of the biggest factors in your ethnicity results is reference populations. So they've taken the DNA from a person who lives in the place where you think you might be from, and they're using their DNA as a baseline to compare you against. So in our example, that would be like surveying everyone who walks out of the burger place and asking them, did you have ketchup or did you have a whole tomato? Now this is another little nuance, right? Ketchup and whole tomatoes are actually kind of related to each other too, but that's a totally different story. Right now, let's just focus on whether or not people had ketchup or whole tomatoes. And you can see as we did the survey, more people used ketchup than used whole tomatoes. So that's reference population data. Now we need to gather the same kind of data for the taco stand. So we do that as people come out, we ask them, did you put ketchup on your taco or whole tomatoes? Now you might be thinking to yourself, hold on, no one's put ketchup on a taco. Everybody's using whole tomatoes or nothing. But that's the thing. We make a lot of assumptions about the ethnicity of various people and oftentimes we're wrong. So if you think no one puts ketchup on a taco, you've never had lunch with a two-year-old because they put ketchup on everything. So, but that is an important thing to keep in mind is the composition of your reference population. So in this case, now we know what our reference population says about burgers and tacos, but now we need to look at B's DNA. What does she have at this key location? Now remember, she got half her DNA from her mom and half her DNA from her dad. So she's going to have two values at this location, one she got from mom and one she got from dad. So you can see she has two ketchups. So what does that mean? Does that mean that B has to have had a burger because people with burgers more than likely had ketchup? Is that what the data is telling us? And that's the thing. The data can't tell us anything for sure. All it can say is that it's more likely that B had a burger and less likely that she had a taco. But could she still have had a taco? 
Absolutely. So when you're getting your DNA test results and you're looking at your ethnicity, what the company is telling you is the place that you're most likely to be from, even though there are other places that are definitely possibilities. For example, your ethnicity result may have told you you're from Great Britain and you're thinking, hold up, my ancestors are totally German. And that's the thing, that German population might have been that lower end, that taco stand. So you were told you had a burger, but really you had a taco. You were told you were from England, but really you're from Germany. So this is what happens within our ethnicity results. So I think it's helpful that you think of your ethnicity results like a series of probabilities. These are more likely and less likely, but it doesn't guarantee you an origin and it certainly doesn't disclude you, or is that a word, from a particular origin. And the problem is the more we get testing done, the more companies we test at, the more opinions we get about where we're from, right? Oh, let me scoot back. The more opinions we get about where we're from. So it's appropriate to take all of the information that you get and look for the similarities, perhaps between the companies that you've tested at. Where are the locations that everyone says that you're from? Possibly those are more solid ground to stand on. But really, it's important to keep in mind, these are just estimates, and they're heavily based on the reference populations at your testing company. So keep that in mind. Just because they say that you had a burger doesn't mean that you really did, or just because they say that you, have, that you didn't have a taco doesn't mean that you didn't. So hopefully that makes sense, my little um, food analogy there. So that's question number one, still one of the most popular questions I get about ethnicity. Next, and perhaps you're in this pool, what kind of DNA test should I take? Maybe you've heard that DNA testing can be helpful or fun or interesting, and you're confused because we do have a lot of options. There are five DNA testing companies that are providing you information that I consider to be helpful for genealogy. So if you wanna find a family member, or if you wanna know where you're from, or you wanna find an ancestor, these are the companies that are most likely to be able to help you based on the tools that they provide. So choose one of these five companies. Now, which company should you choose? Well, there's a lot of factors involved, and I just wanna bring up these five. And I think this is something you can evaluate on your own in a lot of cases. So number one is sample collection. How is this company collecting your DNA? They can either make you spit in a tube or you can swab the inside of your cheek. And very importantly, does this company even test in your country? So if you can't get a kit from the company, well, that kind of eliminates that company as an option. The next are those ethnicity estimates that we just talked about. Companies are doing these very differently. So it's important to recognize this and maybe choose the company that has a reference population in your area. Also, think about database size. If you're looking for ancestors or DNA matches, you'll want to go to the company that has a large database. How about genealogy tools? Some of our companies don't even let you post a family tree, while others do let you post a family tree. So if that's important to you, you might consider that as a factor. There's also genetic tools, right? There's a lot of tools that can be used to help manipulate the way you look at your matches, and that might be important to you. I want you to know that I've written a whole page on my website, and I will provide the link to you either here in the, in the notes or in the syllabus that you'll see here, that, that you'll see the link to. But this is an important topic and it deserves a lot more time than we have right now to cover it. So which DNA test should I take? Next, what should I do first with my DNA match list? So if you've had your DNA tested, maybe you've taken a look at those ethnicity results, but have you been able to dive into your DNA matches? This is the exciting part. This is the part that helps you make discoveries about your family. So what can you do with it? What's the best way to get started? Now, I think the best way to get started is to find best matches. Now, what's a best match? A best match is someone who can help you answer the question that you have about your family. So no matter what you're looking for, a distant ancestor, a more recent ancestor, you need the one, right? The match who's going to help you answer that critical question in your family tree. So let's first talk about a really 
core concept in genetic genealogy. That core concept is that your entire DNA match list can be broken up into groups. So if you think about it, everyone on your match list could actually be broken up into four different groups. Those four groups representing your four great grandparent couples. So ideally, we could take your thousand matches and we would divide them up into these little groups. And then you could just say, oh, well, I wanna research this ancestor. And then you could just go to that pool of people that would help you research that particular ancestor, okay? so. Four groups representing your four great grandparents. Now you can go a step beyond that if you want to. You could divide your entire match list into eight groups representing your two times great grandparents. And if you're super ambitious and if you already know a lot about your genealogy, you could even divide your entire match list into 16 groups representing your three times great grandparents. So I hope you see the value of this really simple concept that whatever you want to research, you need to find the group of people that's going to help you move forward in that particular research. So how do we do this? How do we make these groups? Well, this whole concept depends on something we call the shared matches tool. All of our companies have a shared matches tool and they allow you essentially to make these critical groups. It starts like this. If you're looking at yourself and you're comparing yourself to your whole match list, it's just you and one other person trying to figure out how just the two of you are related. And you can do that, but it can be really tricky. So what the shared matches tool does, it allows you to take you and one other match and then ask the database, show me everyone who's sharing DNA with me and with this other person. It's like a filter. It says, show me just this group of people, not everyone else. What that does is it creates what we sometimes call a genetic network. It's a group of people who are sharing DNA with each other, which then allows you to do genealogy to figure out how is this group related to each other, which can in turn help you figure out the answer to your question. Now, one of the very best ways to use the shared matches tool and to divide your match list into groups is to start with a known match. Now, I meet with a lot of people and a lot of times we'll pull up their DNA match list together and they'll quickly scroll past the first few people and they'll say, oh, I know who that is, that's so-and-so, that's my cousin. Stop, don't ignore these known matches. They are key to your research. And here's how. So let's say you were interested in learning more about this great grandparent couple. You just don't know who they are and you wanna fill in this blank. So you need to divide your entire match list into groups so you can focus on this group that's going to help you answer this question. The best way to start doing that is with a known match. So if you have your first cousin on your dad's side tested, your first cousin is a known match. But when you use the shared matches tool with this known match, what it does is it pulls out of your match list only the matches that are related to this side of your family, this orange group, right? Your first cousin is going to share DNA with you that you both got from your grandparents. So it'll pull out of your DNA match list all of the people that are related to that grandparent couple. Fantastic, right? Now, that's probably going to be a lot of people. And what do you have here, really? You have all the matches from your grandfather's side and from your grandmother's side. You don't want both, right? So what do we do? Well, I call this splitting your match group. So if you do have another known match, perhaps a second cousin from this grandmother's side of your family, If you use shared matches on this second cousin, it will effectively split that group into two. One that's related to your grandmother and the other, which I call your leftovers. And who are the leftovers related to? They're related to that couple that you want to find. And just like that, in just a couple simple steps, 
by just testing a first cousin and a second cousin, you have isolated your best matches. Just the people that are related to the line that you want to research. Now, now that you have these people, what do you do with them? Well, you figure out how they're related to each other. Who is their common ancestor? If you can figure out how they're related to each other, you're probably going to be able to figure out how you are related to them. Okay, so closely related to that step three or that question three is question four. There's a lot of you out there who are looking for biological family members, parents, grandparents, siblings. So take this same concept of dividing your match list into groups and you can apply this concept as well. Now, you say, well, I don't have any known matches. I, I don't have family on that side. Or maybe you're looking for both parents. That's okay. We can use this same principle. What you do instead of starting with a known match, you're just going to start with the match who shares the most DNA with you. Now, as long as that match doesn't share over 2,000 centimorgans, because if they do, they're probably your parent or your full sibling. So as long as that top match is someone under 2,000 centimorgans, this process will work. So what do you do? You click on that match and you use the shared matches tool. So the shared matches tool is going to pull out of your DNA match list all of the people who are related to you and this specific DNA cousin. So that's good, right? It means you've divided up your match list into a manageable group of people. So, but what can you do then? Like you don't know what you're looking for. You don't know what locations or surnames that you're looking for among the pedigree charts of these people because you're really trying to figure out how are they related Hold on just a second. Sometimes crazy stuff happens and you can choose to like theoretically, there we go. Theoretically, I could edit that out, but I think it's just more real this way, guys. I mean, I fell off a stage while giving a lecture once, so this was way better than that. Okay, what I was telling you was, what you're looking for is to figure out how these people are related to each other, right? So one of the best ways you can do that is to find the generation of connection. That's what I call it. You wanna find out how far back in a particular match's genealogy would you need to go in order to figure out your relationship. So if this match is a second cousin, for example, then you need to look back in that matches pedigree to that second cousin level, which means you share great grandparents. What this tells us is one of these couples that you see right here on your matches tree belongs in your tree. But which couple? Well, that's the power of the group, right? You look for the generation of connection for all of those matches in that group. And you're looking for what? for their common ancestor with each other. How are they related to each other? If you can identify their shared ancestor, that ancestral couple is probably also your ancestor. And it will give you one of your great grandparent couples, for example. Okay, so I hope that gives you just a, a basic foundation about how to start attacking your match list to find answers to your genealogy questions. Our last question, and this is an important one, is how can DNA help? Perhaps you're kind of on the fence or not convinced that DNA testing is necessary or helpful. So I've put together just a few reasons why I feel like DNA testing is valuable. Number one, DNA is a unique record. You are the only one of you. There is no one who has ever lived or anyone who will ever live who has your specific DNA profile. That makes your record one of a kind, literally. And if you don't capture it and record it, it will be lost. Second, I've talked to so many people who've gathered so much valuable family information, pictures, original documents. These are, are items that have been passed down generation after generation, but your family member just wasn't the one to get it, right? How about finding lost branches of your family? There are a lot of you who have big families and you've lost touch, you've lost track of the brother of your ancestor and his family moved to a different state eons ago and you've lost track of them. 
DNA testing is a wonderful way to have these reunion kind of experiences. You can also verify your current ancestral connections. Maybe you don't have brick walls. Maybe you feel like you know most of your ancestors. DNA is just that extra stamp of approval that says, yeah, you did this right. And look, your DNA is telling you you're related to this family, not just your paper trail. So these are, again, the top five questions that I felt like most people were interested in learning about. And I'm so grateful that you are interested in learning about it. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for deciding that this was an important part of your day and that this genealogy research matters because it really does. If you have more questions, you can attend some of my other classes here at Roots Tech. There are lots of classes going on in the exhibit hall. I also have a booth. You can visit our booth. It's your DNA guide. And we'll be monitoring the chat in the booth. So you can go in there and ask us all the questions that you have about DNA. So all the ones that I couldn't cover in my lecture, you're welcome to come ask me. Um, you can also reach us online. We are on all the social media channels and we really try to post valuable information out there for you, some tips, some techniques, some videos. Uh, you can always connect with us on social media. You can, of course, reach out to us directly and uh, visit our website where we have several, um, several products to help you in your genealogy journey. Uh, but again, I'm, I'm so grateful that you're here. Thank you for attending class and for being with us.